Leaves from Australian Forests by Henry Kendall Dedication Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug To her who, cast with me in trying days, Stood in the place of health and power and praise, Who, when I thought all light was out, Became a lamp of hope that put my fears to shame, Who faced for love's soul's sake the life austere that waits upon the man of letters here, who, unawares, her deep affection showed by many a touching little wifely mode, whose spirit, self-denying, dear, divine, its sorrows hid, so it might lessen mine. To her, my bright best friend, I dedicate this book of songs, twill help to compensate for much neglect. The act, if not the rhyme, will touch her heart, and lead her to the time of trials past. That which is most intense within these leaves is of her influence, and if aught here is sweetened with a tone sincere like love, it came of love alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Preparatory Sonnets by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. One, I purposed once to take my pen and write not songs like some, tormented and awry with passion, but a cunning harmony of words and music, caught from glen and height, and lucid colours born of woodland light, and shining places where the sea streams lie. But this was when the heat of youth glowed white, and since I've put the faded purpose by. I have no faultless fruits to offer you who read this book, but certain syllables herein are borrowed from unfooted dells and secret hollows dear to noontide dew. And these, at least, though far between and few, may catch the sense like subtle forest spells. 2. So take these kindly, even though there be some notes that unto other lyres belong, stray echoes from the elder sons of song, and think how from its neighbouring native sea the pensive shell doth borrow melody. I would not do the lordly master's wrong by filching fair words from the shining throng whose music haunts me as the wind a tree. Lo, when a stranger in soft Syrian glooms shot through with sunset treads the cedar dells, and hears the breezy ring of elfin bells, far down be where the white-haired cataract booms. He, faint with sweetness, caught from forest smells, bears thence, unwitting, plunder of perfumes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hut by the Black Swamp by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Now comes the fierce north-easter, bound about with clouds and racks of rain, and dry dead leaves go whirling round in rings of dust and sigh like pain across the plain. Now twilight, with a shadowy hand of wild dominionship, doth keep strong hold of hollow straits of land, and watery sounds are loud and deep by gap and steep. Keen fitful gusts that fly before the wings of storm when day hath shut its eyes on mountains, floor by floor, fleet down by whistling box-tree butt against the hut, and, ringed and girt with lurid pomp, far eastern cliffs start up and take thick steaming vapours from a swamp that lieth like a great blind lake of face opaque. The moss that, like a tender grief, about an English ruin clings, what time the wan autumnal leaf faints after many wanderings on windy wings. That gracious growth, whose quiet green is as a love in days austere, was never seen, hath never seen, on slab or roof, deserted here for many a year. Nor comes the bird whose speech is song, whose songs are silvery syllables that unto glimmering woods belong, 
and deep meandering mountain dells by yellow wells but rather here the wild dog halts and lifts the paw and looks and howls and here in ruined forest vaults abide dim dark death-featured owls like monks in cowls across this hut the nettle runs and livid adders make their lair in corners dank from lack of suns and out of fetid furrows stare the growths that scare here summer's grasp of fire is laid on bark and slabs that rot and breed squat ugly things of deadly shade the scorpion and the spiteful seed of centipede unhallowed thunders harsh and dry and flaming noontides mute with heat beneath a breathless brazen sky upon these rifted rafters beat with torrid feet and night by night the fitful gale doth carry past the bittern's boom the dingoes yell the plovers wail while lumbering shadows start and loom and hiss through gloom no sign of grace no hope of green cool blossomed seasons marks the spot but chained to iron doom i ween tis left like skeleton to rot where ruth is not for on this hut hath murder writ with bloody fingers hellish things and god will never visit it with flower or leaf of sweet-faced springs or gentle wings end of poem this recording is in the public domain September in Australia by Henry Kendall read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Grey winter hath gone like a wearisome guest, and behold, for repayment, September comes in with the wind of the west, and the spring in her raiment. The ways of the frost have been filled of the flowers, while the forest discovers wild wings with the halo of hyaline hours and the music of lovers september the maid with the swift silver feet she glides and she graces the valleys of coolness the slopes of the heat with her blossomy traces sweet month with a mouth that is made of a rose she lightens and lingers in spots where the harp of the evening glows attuned by her fingers the stream from its home in the hollow hill slips in a darling old fashion and the day goeth down with a song on its lips whose keynote is passion far out in the fierce bitter front of the sea i stand and remember dead things that were brothers and sisters of thee resplendent september the west when it blows at the fall of the noon and beats on the beaches is filled with a tender and tremulous tune that touches and teaches the stories of youth of the burden of time and the death of devotion come back with the wind and our themes of the rhyme in the waves of the ocean we having a secret to others unknown in the cool mountain mosses may whisper together september alone of our loves and our losses one word for her beauty and one for the grace she gave to the hours and then we may kiss her and suffer her face to sleep with the flowers high places that knew of the gold and the white on the forehead of morning now darken and quake and the steps of the night are heavy with warning her voice in the distance is lofty and loud through the echoing gorges she hath hidden her eyes in a mantle of cloud and her feet in the surges on the tops of the hills on the turreted cones chief temples of thunder the gale like a ghost in the middle watch moans gliding over and under the sea flying white through the rack and the rain leapeth wild at the forelands and the plover whose cries like passion with pain complains in the moorlands o oh, season of changes of shadow and shine september the splendid my song hath no music to mingle with thine and its burden is ended but thou being born of the winds and the sun, by mountain, by river, mayst lighten and listen, and loiter and run with thy voices for ever. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ghost Glen by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. Shut your ears, stranger, or turn from Ghost Glen now, for the paths are grown over, untrodden by men now. Shut your ears, stranger, saith the grey mother, crooning her sorcery runic, when sets the half moon in. To night the northeaster goes travelling slowly, but it never stoops down to that hollow unholy. To night it rolls loud on the ridges red litten, but it cannot abide in that forest sin smitten. For over the pitfall the moon dew is thawing, and with never a body two shadows stand soaring. The wraiths of two sawyers, step under and under, who did a foul murder, and were blackened with thunder. Whenever the storm wind comes driven and driving, through the blood-spattered timber you may see the saw striving, you may see the saw heaving and falling and heaving, whenever the sea creek is chafing and grieving. And across a burnt body, as black as an adder, sits the sprite of a sheepdog, was ever sight sadder. For as the dry thunder splits louder and faster, this sprite of a sheepdog howls for his master. Oh, count your beads deftly, saith the grey mother, crooning her sorcery runic, when sets the half-moon in. And well may she mutter, for the dark hollow laughter you will hear in the saw pits and the bloody logs after. Ay, count your beads deftly, and keep your ways wary, for the sake of the Saviour and sweet Mother Mary. Pray for your peace in these perilous places, and pray for the laying of horrible faces. One starts, with the forehead wrinkled and livid, aghast at the lightnings, sudden and vivid. One telleth, with curses, the gold that they drew there. Ah, cross your breast humbly, from him who they slew there. The stranger, who came from the love, the romantic island, that sleeps on the moaning Atlantic, leaving behind him a patient home, yearning for the steps in the distance, never returning who was left in the forest, shrunken and starkly, burnt by his slayers, so men have said, darkly, with the half-crazy sheepdog who cowered beside there and yelled at the silence and marvelled and died there. Yea, cross your breast humbly and hold your breath tightly, or fly for your life from those shadows unsightly, from the set staring features, cold, and so young, too, and the death on the lips that a mother hath clung to. I tell you that Bushman is braver than most men, who even in daylight doth go through the ghost glen, although in that hollow, unholy and lonely, he sees the dank saw pits and bloody logs only. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Daphne by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Murray Daphne, Layden's daughter, Daphne, Set thyself in silver light, Take thy thoughts of fairest texture, Weave them into words of white, Weave the rhyme of rose-lipped Daphne, Nymph of wooded stream and shade, Flying love of bright Apollo, fleeting type of faultless maid. She, when followed from the forelands by the lord of lyre and lute, sped towards far-singing waters, past deep gardens flushed with fruit, took the path against Peneus, panted by its yellow banks, turned and looked and flew the faster through grey-tufted thicket ranks, flashed among high-flowered sedges, leaped across the brook, and ran down to where the fourfold shadows of a nether glade began. There she dropped, like falling Hesper, heavy hair of radiant head hiding all the young abundance of her beauties white and red. Came the yellow-tressed far darter, came the god whose feet are fire, 
on his lips the name of Daphne, in his eyes a great desire, fond full lips of lord and lover, sad because of suit denied, clear gray eyes made keen by passion, panting, pained, unsatisfied. Here he turned, and there he halted. Now he paused, and now he flew, swifter than his sister's arrows, through soft dells of dreamy dew. Vexed with gleams of Leyden's daughter, dashed along the son of Jove. Fast upon flower trammeled Daphne, fleeting on from grove to grove. Flights of sea wind hard behind him, breaths of bleak and whistling straits. Drifts of driving cloud above him, like a troop of fierce-eyed fates. So he reached the water shallows, then he stayed his steps and heard Daphne drop upon the grasses, fluttering like a wounded bird. Was there help for Leyden's daughter? Saturn's son is high and just. Did he come between her beauty and the fierce far darter's lust? As she lay, the helpless maiden, caught and bound in fast eclipse, did the lips of God drain pleasure from her sweet and swooning lips? Now that these and all love's treasures blushed before the spoiler bare, was the wrong that shall be nameless done and seen and suffered there? No, for Zeus is king and father, Weary nymph and fiery god bend the knee alike before him. He is kind, and he is lord. Therefore sing how clear-browed Pallas, Pallas, friend of prayerful maid, lifted dazzling Daphne lightly, bore her down the breathless glade, did the thing that Zeus commanded. So it came to pass that he who had chased a white-armed virgin caught at her, and clasped a tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Warrigal by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. The Warrigal's lair is pent in bare, black rocks at the gorge's mouth. It is set in ways where summer strays with the sprites of flame and drouth. But when the heights are touched with lights of hoarfrost, sleet and shine, his bed is made of the dead grass blade and the leaves of the windy pine. Through forest bowls the storm wind rolls, vexed of the sea-driven rain, and up in the cliff, through many a rift, the voices of torrents complain. The sad marsh fowl and the lonely owl are heard in the fog wreaths grey, when the warrigal wakes and listens and takes to the woods that shelter the prey. In the gully deeps the blind creek sleeps, and the silver showery moon glides over the hills and floats and fills and dreams in the dark lagoon, while halting hard by the station yard, aghast at the hut flame nigh the warrigal yells and flats and fells aloud with his dismal cry on the topmost peak of mountains bleak the south wind sobs and strays through moaning pine and turpentine and the rippling runnel ways and strong streams flow and great mists go where the warrigal starts to hear the watchdog's bark break sharp in the dark and flees like a phantom of fear. The swift rains beat, and the thunders fleet on the wings of the fiery gale, and down in the glen of pool and fen the wild gums whistle and wail, as over the plains and past the chains of waterholes glimmering deep, the warrigal flies from the shepherd's cries and the clamour of dogs and sheep. He roves through the lands of sultry sands, he hunts in the iron range, untamed a surge of the far sea verge, and fierce and fickle and strange. The white man's track and the haunts of the black he shuns and shudders to see, for his joy he tastes in lonely wastes where his mates are torrent and tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Eurocladon 
by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. On the storm cloven cape, the bitter waves roll with the bergs of the pole and the darks and the damps of the northern sea. For the storm cloven cape is an alien shape with a fearful face, and it moans and it stands outside all lands everlastingly. When the fruits of the year have been gathered in Spain, and the Indian rain is rich on the evergreen lands of the sun, there comes to this cape, to this alien shape, as the waters beat in and the echoes troop forth, the wind of the north, you rock Ladon. And the wilted thyme and the patches past of the nettles cast in the drift of the rift and the broken rhyme are tumbled and blown to every zone with the famished gleed and the plovers thinned by this fourfold wind, this wind sublime. On the wrinkled hills, by starts and fits, the wild moon sits, and the rindles fill and flash and fall in the way of her light through the straitened night, when the sea heralds clamour and elves of the war in the torrents afar hold festival. From ridge to ridge the polar fires on the naked spires with a foreign splendour flit and flow, and clough and cave and architrave have a blood-coloured glamour on roof and on wall, like a nether hall in the hells below. The dead dry lips of the ledges, split by the thunder fit, and the stress of the sprites of the forked flame, anon break out, with a shriek and a shout, like a hard bit of laughter, cracked and thin, from a ghost with a sin too dark for a name. And all through the year the fierce seas run from sun to sun across the face of a vacant world, and the wind flies forth from the wild white north that shivers and harries the heart of things and shapes with its wings a chaos uphurled. Like one who sees a rebel light in the thick of the night as he stumbles and staggers on summits afar, who looks to it still, up hill and hill, with a steadfast hope, though the ways be deep and rough and steep, like a steadfast star. So I, that stand on the outermost peaks of peril, with cheeks blue with the salts of a frosty sea, have learned to wait with an eye elate and a heart intent for the fuller blaze of the beauty that rays like a glimpse for me, of the beauty that grows whenever I hear the winds of fear from the tops and the bases of barrenness call, and the duplicate law which I learn evermore is of harmony filling and rounding the storm and the marvellous form that governs all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Araluen by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. River myrtle rimmed and set deep amongst unfooted dells, daughter of grey hills of wet, borne by mossed and yellow wells. Now that soft September lays tender hands on thee and thine, let me think of blue-eyed days, star-like flowers and leaves of shine. Cities soil the life with rust. Water banks are cool and sweet. River, tired of noise and dust, here I come to rest my feet. Now the month from shade to sun fleets and sings supremest songs. Now the willful woodwinds run through the tangled cedar throngs. Here are cushioned tufts and turns where the sumptuous noontide lies. Here are seen, by flags and ferns, summer's large luxurious eyes. On this spot one winter casts eyes of Ruth, and spares its green from his bitter sea-nursed blasts, spears of rain and hailstones keen. Rather here abideth spring, lady of a lovely land, dear to leaf and fluttering wing, deep in blooms by breezes fanned. Faithful friend beyond the main, Friend the time nor change makes cold, Now, like ghosts, return again Pallid, perished days of old. 
Ah, the days, the old, old theme, never stale, but never new, floating like a pleasant dream back to me and back to you. Since we rested on these slopes, seasons fierce have beaten down ardent loves and blossoming hopes, loves that lift and hopes that crown. But, believe me, still mine eyes often fill with light that springs from divinity, which lies ever at the heart of things. Solace do I sometimes find, where you used to hear with me songs of stream and forest wind, tones of wave and harp-like tree. Araluen, home of dreams, fairer for its flowerful glade than the face of Persian streams or the slopes of Syrian shade. Why should I still love it so, friend and brother far away? Ask the winds that come and go, what hath brought me here to-day. Evermore of you I think, when the leaves begin to fall, where our river breaks its brink, and a rest is over all. Evermore, in quiet lands, friend of mine beyond the sea, memory comes with cunning hands, stays, and paints your face for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Euroma by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Footnote Charles Harper was buried at Euroma, New South Wales, but this poem refers to the grave of a stranger whose name is unknown. End footnote They built his mound of the rough red ground by the dip of a desert dwell, where all things sweet are killed by the heat and scattered or flat and fell. In a burning zone they left him alone past the uttermost western plain, and the nightfall dim heard his funeral hymn in the voices of wind and rain. The songs austere of the forests drear and the echoes of cliff and cave, when the dark is keen where the storm hath been, fleet over the faraway grave, and through the days when the torrid rays strike down on a coppery gloom, some spirit grieves in the perished leaves, whose theme is that desolate tomb. No human foot or paw of brute halts now where the stranger sleeps, but cloud and star his fellows are, and the rain that sobs and weeps. The dingo yells by the far iron fells, the plover is loud in the range, but they never come near to the slumberer here, whose rest is a rest without change. Ah, in his life, had he mother or wife to wait for his step on the floor? Did beauty wax dim while watching for him, who passed through the threshold no more? Doth it trouble his head? He is one with the dead. He lies by the alien streams, and sweeter than sleep is death that is deep and unvexed by the lordship of dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Eli Creek by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. A strong sea wind flies up and sings across the blown wet border, whose stormy echo runs and rings like bells in wild disorder. Fierce breath hath vexed the foreland's face, it glistens, glooms, and glistens. But deep within this quiet place, sweet Illa lies and listens. Sweet Illa of the shining sands, she sleeps in shady hollows, with August flits with flowerful hands and silver summer follows. Far up the naked hills is heard a noise of many waters, but green-haired Illa lies unstirred amongst her star-like daughters. The tempest, pent in moaning ways, awakes the shepherd yonder, but Illa dreams unknown two days, whose wings are wind and thunder. Here fairy hands and floral feet are brought by bright October. Here stained with grapes and smit with heat comes autumn sweet and sober here lovers rest what time the red and yellow colours mingle 
and daylight droops with dying head beyond the western dingle and here from month to month the time is kissed by peace and pleasure while nature sings her woodland rhyme and hoards her woodland treasure ah illa creek ere evening spreads her wings o'er towns unshaded how oft we seek thy mossy beds to lave our foreheads faded for let me whisper then we find the strength that lives nor falters in wood and water waste and wind and hidden mountain altars end of poem this recording is in the public domain moss on a wall by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by algy pug dim dreams it hath of singing ways of far-off woodland waterheads and shining ends of april days amongst the yellow runnel beds stoop closer to the ruined wall whereon the wilful wilding sleeps as if its home were waterfall by dripping clefts and shadowy steeps a little waif whose beauty takes a touching tone because it dwells so far away from mountain lakes and lily leaves and lightning fells deep hidden in delicious floss it nestles sister from the heat a gracious growth of tender moss whose nights are soft whose days are sweet swift gleams across its petals run with winds that hum a pleasant tune serene surprises of the sun and whispers from the lips of noon the evening coloured apple trees are faint with july's frosty breath but lo this stranger getteth ease and shines amidst the strays of death and at the turning of the year when august wanders in the cold the raiment of the nursling here is rich with green and glad with gold o oh, friend of mine to one whose eyes are vexed because of alien things for ever in the wall moss lies the peace of hills and hidden springs from faithless lips and fickle lights the tired pilgrim sets his face and thinketh here of sounds and sights in many a lovely forest place and when by sudden fits and starts the sunset on the moss doth burn he often dreams and lo the marts and streets are changed to dells of fern for let me say the wilding placed by hands unseen amongst these stones restores a past by time effaced lost loves and long forgotten tones as sometimes songs and scenes of old come faintly unto you and me when winds are wailing in the cold and rains are sobbing on the sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain Campaspe by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Turn from the ways of this woman Campaspe, we call her by name She is fairer than flowers of the fire She is brighter than brightness of flame As a song that strikes swift to the heart With the beat of the blood of the south With a light and a leap and a smart Is the play of her perilous mouth her eyes are as splendours that break in the rain at the set of the sun but turn from the steps of campaspe a woman to look at and shun dost thou know of the cunning of beauty take heed to thyself and beware of the trap in the droop of the raiment the snare in the folds of the hair she is fulgent in flashes of pearl the breeze with her breathing is sweet but fly from the face of the girl there is death in the fall of her feet is she maiden or marvel of marble oh rather a tigress at wait to pounce on thy soul for her pastime a leopard for love or for hate woman of shadow and furnace she biteth her lips to restrain speech that springs out when she sleepeth by the stirs and the starts of her pain as music half shapen of sorrow with its wants and its infinite wail is the voice of campaspe the beauty at bay with her passion dead pale go out from the courts of her loving nor tempt the fierce dance of desire where thy life will be shrivelled like stubble 
in the stress and the fervour of fire i know of one gentle as moonlight she is sad as the shine of the moon but touching the ways of her eyes are she comes to my soul like a tune like a tune that is filled with faint voices of the loved and the lost and the lone doth this stranger abide with my silence like a tune with a tremulous tone the leopard we call her campaspe i pluck at a rose and i stir to think of this sweet-hearted maiden what name is too tender for her end of poem this recording is in the public domain on a cattle track by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by algie pug where the strength of dry thunder splits hill rocks asunder and the shouts of the desert wind break by the gullies of deepness and ridges of steepness lo the cattle track twists like a snake like a sea of dead embers burnt white by decembers a plain to the left of it lies and six fleeting horses dash down the creek courses with the terror of thirst in their eyes the false strength of fever that deadly deceiver gives foot to each famishing beast and overlands rotten by rain winds forgotten the mirage gleams out in the east ah the waters are hidden from riders and ridden in a stream where the cattle track dips and death on their faces is scoring fierce traces and the drouth is a fire on their lips it is far to the station and gaunt desolation is a spectre that glooms in the way like a red smoke the air is like a hell light its glare is and as flame are the feet of the day the wastes are like metal that forges unsettle when the heat of the furnace is white and the cool breeze that bloweth when an english sun goeth is unknown to the wild desert night a cry of distress there a horseman the less there the mock waters shine like a moon it is speed and speed faster from this hole of disaster and hurrah for yon god-sent lagoon doth a devil deceive them ah now let us leave them we are burdened in life with the sad our portion is trouble our joy is a bubble and the gladdest is never too glad from the pale tracts of peril past mountain heads sterile to a sweet river shadowed with reeds where summer steps lightly and winter beams brightly the hoof-rutted cattle track leads there soft is the moonlight and tender the noonlight there fiery things falter and fall and there may be seen now the green and the gold now and the wings of a peace over all hush bitten and plover go wind to thy cover away by the snow-smitten pole the rotten leaf falleth the forest rain calleth and what is the end of the whole some men are successful after seasons distressful now masters the drift of my tale but the brink of salvation is a lair of damnation for others who struggle yet fail end of poem this recording is in the public domain to damascus by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson where the sinister sun of the syrians beat on the brittle brightest stubble and the camels fell back from the swords of the heat came saul with a fire in the soles of his feet and a forehead of trouble and terrified faces to left and to right before and behind him fled away with the speed of a maddening fright the cloughs of the bat and the chasms of night each hoping the zealot would fail in his flight to find him and bind him for behold you the strong man of tarsus came down with breathings of slaughter from the priests of the city the chiefs of the town the lords with the sword and the sires with the gown to harry the christians and trample and drown and waste them like water he was ever a fighter this son of the jews a fighter in earnest and the lord took delight in the strength of his thews for he knew he was one of the few he could choose to fight out his battles and carry his news of marvellous truth through the dark and the dews and the desert and the lands furnished he knew he was one of the few he could take for his mission supernal 
whose feet would not falter whose limbs would not ache through the waterless lands of the thorn and the snake and the ways of the wild bearing up for the sake of a beauty eternal and therefore the road to damascus was burned with a swift sudden brightness while saul with his face in the bitter dust learned of the sin which he did ere he tumbled and turned aghast at god's whiteness of the sin which he did ere he covered his head from the strange revelation but thereafter you know of the life that he led how he preached to the peoples and suffered and sped with the wonderful words which his master had said from nation to nation now would we be like him who suffer and see if the chooser should choose us for i tell you brave brothers whoever you be it is right till all learn to look further and see that our master should use us it is right till all learn to discover and class that our master should ask us for now we may judge of the truth through a glass and the road over which they must evermore pass who would think that for many and fight for the mass is the road to damascus end of poem this recording is in the public domain Bellbirds by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher Bellbirds By channels of coolness the echoes are calling And down the dim gorges I hear the creek falling It lives in the mountain Where moss and the sedges touch with their beauty the banks and the ledges through breaks of the cedar and sycamore bowers struggles the light that is love to the flowers, and softer than slumber, and sweeter than singing, the notes of the bellbirds are running and ringing. The silver-voiced bellbirds, the darlings of daytime, they sing in September their songs of the Maytime. When shadows wax strong and the thunderbolts hurtle, they hide with their fear in the leaves of the myrtle. When rain and the sunbeams shine mingled together, they start up like fairies that follow fair weather, and straightway the hues of their feathers unfolden are the green and the purple, the blue and the golden. October, the maiden of bright yellow tresses, loiters for love in these cool wildernesses, loiters knee-deep in the grasses to listen, where dripping rocks gleam and the leafy pools glisten. Then is the time when the water moons splendid break with their gold, and are scattered or blended over the creeks, till the woodlands have warning of songs of the bellbird and wings of the morning. Welcome as waters unkissed by the summers are the voices of bellbirds to thirsty far-comers, when fiery December sets foot in the forest, and the need of the wayfarer presses the sorest, pent in the ridges for ever and ever, the bellbirds direct him to spring and to river, with ring and with ripple, like runnels whose torrents are toned by the pebbles and leaves in the currents. Often I sit, looking back to a childhood mixed with the sights and sounds of the wildwood, longing for power and the sweetness to fashion lyrics with beats like the heartbeats of passion, songs interwoven of lights and of laughters, borrowed from bellbirds in far forest rafters, so I might keep in the city and alleys the beauty and strength of the deep mountain valleys, charming to slumber the pain of my losses with glimpses of creeks and a vision of mosses. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Death in the Bush by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker The hut was built of bark and shrunken slabs That wore the marks of many rains And showed dry floors wherein had crept and nestled rot. Moreover, round the bases of the bark Were left the tracks of flying forest fires, As you may see them on the lower bowl Of every elder of the native woods. 
for ere the early settlers came and stocked these wilds with sheep and kine the grasses grew so that they took the passing pilgrim in and whelmed him like a running sea from sight and therefore through the fiercer summer months while all the swamps were rotten while the flats were baked and broken when the clayey rifts yawned wide half choked with drifted herbage past spontaneous flames would burst from thence and race across the prairies all day long at night the winds were up and then with fourfold speed a harsh gigantic growth of smoke and fire would roar along the bottoms in the wake of fainting flocks of parrots wallaroos and wildered wild things scattering right and left for safety vague throughout the general gloom anon the nearer hillside growing trees would take the surges thus from bough to bough was borne the flaming terror bowl and spire rank after rank now pillared ringed and rolled in blinding blaze stood out against the dead down smothered dark for fifty leagues away for fifty leagues and when the winds were strong for fifty more but in the olden time these fires were counted as the harbingers of life essential storms since out of smoke and heat there came across the midnight ways abundant comfort with upgathered clouds and runnels babbling of a plenteous fall so comes the southern gale at evenfall the swift brickfielder of the local folk about the streets of sydney when the dust lies burnt on glaring windows and the men look forth from doors of drouth and drink the change with thirsty haste and that most thankful cry of here it is the cool bright blessed rain the hut i say was built of bark and slabs and stood the centre of a clearing hemmed by hurdle yards and ancients of the blacks these moped about their lazy fires and sang wild ditties of the old days with a sound of sorrow like an everlasting wind which mingled with the echoes of the noon and moaned amongst the noises of the night from thence a cattle track with link to link ran off against the fish pools to the gap which sets you face to face with gleaming miles of broad orara winding in amongst black barren ridges where the nether spurs are fenced about by cotton scrub and grass blue bitten with the salt of many droughts twas here the shepherd housed him every night and faced the prospect like a patient soul borne up by some vague hope of better days and god's fine blessing in his faithful wife until the humour of his malady took cunning changes from the good to bad and laid him lastly on a bed of death two months thereafter when the summer heat had roused the serpent from his rotten lair and made a noise of locusts in the boughs it came to this that as the blood-red sun of one fierce day of many slanted down obliquely past the nether jags of peaks and gulfs of mist the tardy night came vexed by belted clouds and scuds that wheeled and whirled to left and right about the brazen cliffs of ridges rigid with a leaden gloom then took the cattle to the forest camps with vacant terror and the hustled sheep stood dumb against the hurdles even like a fallen patch of shadowed mountain snow and ever through the curlew's call afar the storm grew on while round the stinted slabs sharp snaps and hisses came and went and came the huddled tokens of a mighty blast which ran with an exceeding bitter cry across the tumbled fragments of the hills and through the sluices of the gorge and glen so therefore all about the shepherd's hut that space was mute save when the fastened dog without a kennel caught a passing glimpse of firelight moving through the lighted chinks for then he knew the hints of warmth within and stood and set his great pathetic eyes in wind and wet imploring to be loosed not often now the watcher left the couch of him she watched since in his fitful sleep his lips would stir to wayward themes and close with bodeful catches once she moved away half deafened by terrific claps and stooped and looked without to see a pillar dim of gathered gusts and fiery rain anon the sick man woke and startled by the noise stared round the room with dull delirious sight at this wild thing and that for through his eyes the place took fearful shapes and fever showed strange crosswise lights about his pillow head he catching there at some phantasmic help sat upright on the bolster with a cry of where is jesus it is bitter cold and then because the thunder calls outside were mixed for him with slanders of the past he called his weeping wife by name and said come closer darling we shall speed away across the seas 
and seek some mountain home shut in from liars and the wicked words that track us day and night and night and day so waned the sad refrain and those poor lips whose latest phrases were for peace grew mute and into everlasting silence passed as fares a swimmer who hath lost his breath in wildering seas afar from any help who fronting death can never realize the dreadful presence but is prone to clutch at every weed upon the weltering wave so fared the watcher pouring o'er the last of him she loved with dazed and stupid stare half conscious of the sudden loss and lack of all that bound her life but yet without the power to take her mighty sorrow in then came a patch or two of starry sky and through a reef of cloven thundercloud the soft moon looked a patient face beyond the fierce impatient shadows of the slopes and the harsh voices of the broken hills a patient face and one which came and wrought a lovely silence like a silver mist across the rainy relics of the storm for in the breaks and pauses of her light the gale died out in gusts yet evermore about the roof-tree on the dripping eaves the damp wind loitered and a fitful drift sloped through the silent curtains and athwart the dead there when the glare had dropped behind a mighty ridge of gloom the woman turned and sat in darkness face to face with god and said i know she said that thou art wise that when we build and hope and hope and build and see our best things fall it comes to pass for evermore that we must turn to thee and therefore now because i cannot find the faintest token of divinity in this my latest sorrow let thy light inform mine eyes so i may learn to look on something past the sight which shuts and blinds and seems to drive me wholly lord from thee now waned the moon beyond complaining depths and as the dawn looked forth from showery woods whereon had dropped a hint of red and gold there went about the crooked cavern eaves low flute-like echoes with a noise of wings and waters flying down far hidden fells then might be seen the solitary owl perched in the clefts scared at the coming light and staring outward like a sea-shelled thing chased to his cover by some bright fierce foe as at a monster in the middle waste at last the great kingfisher came and called across the hollows loud with early whips and lighted laughing on the shepherd's hut and roused the widow from a swoon like death this day and after it was noised abroad by blacks and straggling horsemen on the roads that he was dead who had been sick so long there flocked a troop from far surrounding runs to see their neighbour and to bury him and men who had forgotten how to cry rough flinty fellows of the native bush now learned the bitter way beholding there the wasted shadow of an iron frame brought down so low by years of fearful pain and marking too the woman's gentle face and all the pathos in her moaned reply of masters we have lived in better days one stooped a stockman from the nearer hills to loose his wallet strings from whence he took a bag of tea and laid it on her lap then sobbing god will help you missus yet he sought his horse with most bewildered eyes and spurring swiftly galloped down the glen where black orara nightly chafes his brink midway between lamenting lines of oak and warra's gap the shepherd's grave was built and there the wild dog pauses in the midst of moonless watchers howling through the gloom at hopeless shadows flitting to and fro what time the east wind hums his darkest hymn and rains beat heavy on the ruined leaf there while the autumn in the cedar trees sat cooped about by cloudy evergreens the widow sojourned on the silent road and mutely faced the barren mound and plucked a straggling shrub from thence and passed away heartbroken on to sydney where she took her passage in an english vessel bound to london for her home of other years at rest not near with sorrow on his grave and roses quickened into beauty wrapped in all the pathos of perennial bloom but far from these beneath the fretful clay of lands within the lone perpetual cry of hermit plovers and the night-like oaks all moaning for the peace which never comes at rest and she who sits and waits behind is in the shadows but her faith is sure and one fine promise of the coming days is breaking like a blessed morning far on hills that slope through darkness up to god end of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. A Spanish Love Song by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker From Andalusian gardens I bring the rose and rue And leaves of subtle odour to weave a gift for you. You'll know the reason wherefore the sad is with the sweet. My flowers may lie, as I would, a carpet for your feet. The heart, the heart is constant, it holds its secret, dear. But often in the night time I keep awake for fear. I have no hope to whisper, I have no prayer to send. God save you from such passion, God help you from such end. You first, you last, you false love, in dreams your lips I kiss, and thus I greet your shadow, take this, and this, and this. When dews are on the casement, and winds are in the pine, I have you close beside me, in sleep your mouth is mine. I never see you elsewhere, you never think of me, but fired with fever for you, content I am to be. You will not turn, my darling, nor answer when I call, but yours are soul, our body, and love of mine and all. You splendid Spaniard, listen, my passion leaps to flame for neck and cheek and dimple, and cunning shades of shame. I tell you, I would gladly give hell myself to keep, to cling to half a moment the lips I taste in sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last of His Tribe by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker He crouches and buries his face on his knees and hides in the dark of his hair for he cannot look up to the storm-smitten trees or think of the loneliness there, of the loss and the loneliness there. The wallaroos grope through the tufts of the grass and turn to their coverts for fear but he sits in the ashes and lets them pass where the boomerangs sleep with the spear with the nulla, the sling, and the spear. Alula, behold him, the thunder that breaks on the tops of the rocks with the rain, and the wind which drives up with the salt of the lakes have made him a hunter again, a hunter and fisher again. For his eyes have been full with a smouldering thought, but he dreams of the hunts of yore, and of foes that he sought, and of fights that he fought with those who will battle no more, who will go to the battle no more. It is well that the water which tumbles and fills goes moaning and moaning along, for an echo rolls out from the sides of the hills, and he starts at a wonderful song, at the sound of a wonderful song. And he sees through the rents of the scattering fogs the corroboree warlike and grim, and the lubra who sat by the fire on the logs to watch like a mourner for him, like a mother and mourner for him. Will he go in his sleep from these desolate lands, like a chief to the rest of his race, with the honey-voiced woman who beckons and stands, and gleams like a dream in his face, like a marvellous dream in his face? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Raccoon by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker Lo, in storms the triple-headed hill, whose dreaded bases battle with the seas, looms across fierce widths of fleeting, waters beating evermore on roaring lees. Aracoon, the black, the lonely, housed with only cloud and rain-wind, mist and damp, round whose foam-drenched feet and nether depths together sullen sprites of thunder tramp. There the east hums loud and surly, late and early, through the chasms and the caves, and across the naked verges leap the surges, white and wailing waifs of waves. Day by day the sea-fogs gathered, tempest-fathered, pitch their tents on yonder peak, yellow drifts and fragments lying where the flying torrents chafe the cloven creek. And at nightfall, when the driven bolts of heaven smite the rock and break the bluff, thither troop the elves whose home is where the foam is and the echo and the clough. Ever girt about with noises, stormy voices, and the salt breath of the strait, stands the steadfast mountain giant, grim, reliant, dark as death and firm as fate. 
so when trouble treads like thunder weak men under treads and breaks the thews of these set thyself to bear it bravely greatly gravely like the hill in yonder seas since the wrestling and endurance give assurance to the faint at bay with pain that no soul to strong endeavour yoked for ever works against the tide in vain end of poem this recording is in the public domain the voyage of telegonus by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by peter tucker ill fares it with the man whose lips are set to bitter themes and words that spite the gods for seeing how the son of saturn sways with eyes and ears for all this one shall halt as on hard hurtful hills his days shall know the plaintive front of sorrow level looks with cries ill-favoured shall be dealt to him and this shall be that he may think of peace as one might think of alienated lips of sweetness touched for once in kind warm dreams yea fathers of the high and holy face this soul thus sinning shall have cause to sob ah ah for sleep and space enough to learn the wan wild hyrie's aggregated song that starts the dwellers in distorted heights with all the meaning of perpetual sighs heard in the mountain deserts of the world and where the green-haired waters glide between the thin lank weeds and mallows of the marsh but thou to whom these things are like to shapes that come of darkness thou whose life slips past regarding rather these with mute fast mouth hear none the less how fleet telegonus the brass-clad hunter first took oar and smote swift eastward going seas with face direct for narrowing channels and the twofold coasts past colchis and the fierce simplegades and utmost islands washed by streams unknown for in a time when phasus white and wide and drove with violent waters blown of wind against the bare salt limits of the land it came to pass that joined with cytherea the black-browed ares chafing for the wrong ulysses did him on the plains of troy set heart against the king and when the storms sang high in thunder and the thracian rain the god bethought him of a pale-mouthed priest of thebe kin to ancient Cariclo, and of an omen which the prophet gave that touched on death and grief to ithaca then knowing how a heavy-handed fate had laid itself on circe's brass-clad son he pricked the hunter with a lust that turned all thoughts to travel and the seas remote but chiefly now he stirred telegonus to longings for his father's exiled face and dreams of rest and honey-hearted love and quiet death with much of funeral flame far in the mountains of a favoured land beyond the wars and wailings of the waves so past the ridges where the coast abrupt dips greyly westward circe's strong-armed son swept down the foam of sharp divided straits and faced the stress of opening seas sheer out the vessel drave but three long moons the gale moaned round and swift strong streams of fire revealed the labouring rowers and the lightning surf pale watchers deafened of sonorous storm and dipping decks and rents of ruined sails yea when the hollow ocean-driven ship wheeled sideways like a chariot cloven through in hard hot battle and the night came up against strange headlands lying east and north behold a black wild wind with death to all ran shoreward charged with flame and thunder smoke which blew the waters into wastes of white and broke the bark as lightning breaks the pine whereat the sea in fearful circles showed unpitied faces turned from zeus and light wan swimmers wasted with their agony and hopeless eyes and moaning mouths of men but one held by the fragments of the wreck and ares knew him for telegonus whom heavy-handed fate had chained to deeds of dreadful note with sin beyond a name so seeing this the black-browed lord of war arrayed about by jove's authentic light shot down amongst the shattered clouds and called with mighty strain betwixt the gaps of storm oceanus oceanus whereat the surf sprang white as when a keel divides the gleaming centre of a gathered wave and ringed with flakes of splendid fire of foam the son of terror rose half way and blew the triple trumpet of the water gods at which great winds fell back and all the sea grew dumb as on the land a war-feast breaks when deep sleep falls upon the souls of men 
then aries of the night-like brow made known the brass-clad hunter of the facile feet hard clinging to the slippery logs of pine and told the omen to the hoary god that touched on death and grief to ithaca wherefore oceanus with help of hand bore by the chin the warrior of the north a moaning mass across the shallowing surge and cast him on the rocks of alien shores against a wintry morning shot with storm here also thou how mighty gods sustain the men set out to work the ends of fate which fill the world with tales of many tears and vex the sad face of humanity six days and nights the brass-clad chief abode pent up in caverns by the straightening seas and fed on ferns and limpets but the dawn before the strong sun of the seventh brought a fume of fire and smells of savoury meat and much rejoicing as from neighbouring feasts at which the hunter seized with sudden lust sprang up the crags and like a dream of fear leapt shouting at a huddled host of hinds amongst the fragments of their steaming food and as the hoarse wood wind in autumn sweeps to every zone the hissing latter leaves so fleet telegonus by dint of spear and strain of thunderous voice did scatter these east south and north twas then the chief had rest hard by the outer coast of ithaca unknown to him who ate the spoil and slept nor stayed he hand thereafter but when noon burned dead on misty hills of stunted fir this man shook slumber from his limbs and sped against hoar beaches and the kindled cliffs of falling waters these he waded through beholding past the forests of the west a break of light and homes of many men and shining corn and flowers and fruits of flowers yea seeing these the facile-footed chief grasped by the knot the huge aeon lance and fell upon the farmers wherefore they left hoe and plough and crouched in heights remote companioned with the grey-winged fogs but he made waste their fields and throve upon their toil as throve the boar the fierce four-footed curse which artemis did raise in caledon to make stern mouths wax white with foreign fear all in the wild beginning of the world so one went down and told laertes son of what the brass-clad stranger from the straits had worked in ithaca whereat the king rose like a god and called his mighty heir telemachus the wisest of the wise and these two having counsel strode without and armed them with the arms of warlike days the helm the javelin and the sun-like shield and glancing greaves and quivering stars of steel yea stern ulysses rusted not with rest but dread as ares gleaming on his car gave out the reins and straightway all the lands were struck by noise of steed and shouts of men and furious dust and splendid wheels of flame meanwhile the hunter starting from a sleep in which the pieces of a broken dream had shown him circe with most tearful face caught at his spear and stood like one at bay when summer brings about arcadian horns and headlong horses mixed with maddened hounds then huge ulysses like a fire of fight sprang sideways on the flying car and drave full at the brass-clad warrior of the north his massive spear but fleet telegonus stooped from the death but heard the speedy lance sing like a thin wind through the steaming air yet he dismayed not by the dreadful foe unknown to him dealt out his strength and aimed a strenuous stroke at great laertes son which missed the shield but beat through flesh and bone and drank the blood and dragged the soul from thence so fell the king and one cried ithaca ah ithaca and turned his face and wept then came another wise telemachus who knelt beside the man of many days and poured upon the face but lo the life was like bright water spilt in sands of thirst a wasted splendour swiftly drawn away yet held he by the dead he heeded not the moaning warrior who had learnt his sin who waited now like one in lairs of pain apart with darkness hungry for his fate for had not wise telemachus the law which makes the pale-mouthed seer content to sleep amidst the desolations of the world so therefore he who knew telegonus the child of circe by laertes son was set to be a scourge of zeus smote not but rather sat with moody eyes and mused and watched the dead for who may brave the gods yet o oh, my fathers when the people came and brought the holy oils and perfect fire and built the pile and sang the tales of troy 
of desperate travels in the olden time by shadowy mountains and the roaring sea near windy sands and past the thracian snows the man who crossed them all to see his sire and had a loyal heart to give the king instead of blows this man did little more than moan outside the fume of funeral rites all in a rushing twilight full of rain and clap his palms for sharper pains than swords yea when the night broke out against the flame and lonely noises loitered in the fens this man nor stirred nor slept but lay at wait with fastened mouth for who may brave the gods end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sitting by the Fire by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher Sitting by the Fire Ah, the solace in the sitting, sitting by the fire, When the wind without is calling, And the fourfold clouds are falling, With the rain racks intermitting over slope and spire. Ah, the solace in the sitting, sitting by the fire then and then a man may ponder sitting by the fire over fair far days and faces shining in sweet coloured places ere the thunder broke asunder life and dear desire thus and thus a man may ponder sitting by the fire waves of song pursue perplex me sitting by the fire just a note and lo the change then like a child i turn and range then till a shadow starts to vex me passion's wasted pyre so do songs pursue perplex me sitting by the fire night by night the old old story sitting by the fire night by night the dead leaves grieve me ah the touch when youth shall leave me like my father's shrunken hoary with the years that tire night by night that old old story sitting by the fire sing for slumber sister clara sitting by the fire i could hide my head and sleep now far from those who laugh and weep now like a trammelled faint wayfarer neath yon mountain spire sing for slumber sister clara sitting by the fire end of poem this recording is in the public domain cleone by henry kendall read for librivox dot org by algy pug sing her a song of the sun fill it with tones of the stream echoes of waters that run glad with a gladdening gleam let it be sweeter than rain lit by a tropical moon light in the words of the strain love in the ways of the tune softer than seasons of sleep dearer than life at its best give her a ballad to keep wove of the passionate west give it and say of the hours haunted and hallowed of thee flower-like woman of flowers what shall the end of them be you that have loved her so much loved her asleep and awake trembled because of her touch what have you said for her sake far in the falls of the day down in the meadows of myrrh what has she left you to say filled with the beauty of her take her the best of your thoughts let them be gentle and grave say i have come to thy courts maiden with all that i have so she may turn with her sweet face to your love and to you learning the ways to repeat words that are brighter than dew end of poem this recording is in the public domain charles harper by henry kendall read for librivox dot org by algy pug where harper lies the rainy streams and wet hill heads and hollows weeping are swift with wind and white with gleams and hoarse with sounds of storms unsleeping 
fit grave it is for one whose song was tuned by tones he caught from torrents and filled with mountain breaths and strong wild notes of falling forest currents so let him sleep the rugged hymns and broken lights of woods above him and let me sing how sorrow dims the eyes of those that used to love him as april in the wilted wold turns faded eyes on splendours waning what time the latter leaves are old and ruin strikes the strays remaining so we that knew this singer dead whose hands attuned the harp australian may set the face and bow the head and mourn his fate and fortunes alien the burden of a perished faith when sighing through his speech of sweetness with human hints of time and death and subtle notes of incompleteness but when the fiery power of youth had passed away and left him nameless serene as light and strong as truth he lived his life untired and tameless and far and free this man of men with wintry hair and wasted feature had fellowship with gorge and glen and learned the loves and runes of nature strange words of wind and rhymes of rain and whispers from the inland fountains are mingled in his various strain with leafy breaths of piney mountains but as the undercurrents sigh beneath the surface of a river the music of humanity dwells in his forest psalms for ever no soul was he to sit on heights and live with rocks apart and scornful the lights of men were his delights and common troubles made him mournful the flying forms of unknown powers with lofty wonder caught and filled him but there were days of gracious hours when sights and sounds familiar thrilled him the pathos worn by wayside things the passion found in simple faces struck deeper than the life of springs or strength of storms and sea-swept places but now he sleeps the tired bard the deepest sleep and lo i proffer these tender leaves of my regard with hands that falter as they offer end of poem this recording is in the public domain Kuji by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by algie pug Sing the song of wave-worn Kuji, Kuji in the distance white, With its jags and points disrupted, Gaps and fractures fringed with light, Haunt of gleeds and restless plovers Of the melancholy wail, Ever lending deeper pathos To the melancholy gale. There, my brothers, down the fishes, Chasms deep and wan and wild, Grows the sea-bloom, One that blushes like a shrinking Fair blind child. And amongst the oozing forelands, many a glad green rock vine runs, getting ease on earthy ledges, sheltered from December suns. Often, when a gusty morning, rising cold and grey and strange, lifts its face from watery spaces, vistas full with cloudy change, bearing up a gloomy burden which anon begins to wane, fading in the sudden shadow of a dark determined rain. Do I seek an eastern window, so to watch the breakers beat round the steadfast crags of Kuji, dim with drifts of driving sleet, hearing hollow mournful noises sweeping down a solemn shore, while the grim sea caves are tideless, and the storm strives at their core. Often, when the floating vapours fill the silent autumn leas, dreaming memories fall like moonlight over silver sleeping seas, Youth and I and love together, other times and other themes, come to me unsung, unwept for, through the faded evening gleams. Come to me and touch me mutely, I that looked and longed so well. Shall I look and yet forget them? Who may know, or who foretell? Though the southern wind roams, shadowed with its immemorial grief, where the frosty wings of winter leave their whiteness on the leaf. Friend of mine beyond the waters, here and there, these perished days haunt me with their sweet dead faces and their old divided ways. You that helped and you that loved me, take this song and when you read, 
let the lost things come about you set your thoughts and hear and heed time has laid his burden on us we who wear our manhood now we would be the boys we have been free of heart and bright of brow be the boys for just an hour with the splendour and the speech of thy lights and thunders could ye flying up thy gleaming beach heart's desire and heart's division who would come and say to me with the eyes of far-off friendship you are as you used to be something glad and good has left me here with sickening discontent tired of looking neither knowing what it was or where it went so it is this sight of Kuji shining in the morning dew sets me stumbling through dim summers once on fire with youth and you summers pale as southern evenings when the year has lost its power and the wasted face of april weeps above the withered flower not that seasons bring no solace not that time lacks light and rest but the old things were the dearest and the old loves seem the best we that start at songs familiar we that tremble at a tone floating down the ways of music like a sigh of sweetness flown we can never feel the freshness never find again the mood left among fair featured places brightened of our brotherhood this and this we have to think of when the night is over all and the woods begin to perish and the rains begin to fall end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ojiges by Henry Kendall read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Stand out, swift footed leaders of the horns, and draw strong breath, and fill the hollowy cliff with shocks of clamour, let the chasm take the noise of many trumpets, lest the hunt should die across the dim Aeonian hills, nor break through thunder and the surf white cave that hems about the old Ojiges and bars the sea wind rain wind and the sea much fierce delight hath old eyed ojiges a hairless shadow in a lion's skin in tumult and the gleam of flying spears and wild beasts vexed to death for saith he here lying broken do i count the days for every trouble being like the tree the many wintered father of the trunks on yonder ridges wherefore it is well to feel the dear blood kindling in my veins at sound of boar or battle yea to find a sudden stir like life about my feet and tingling pulses through this frame of mine what time the cold clear dayspring like a bird afar off settles on the frost-bound peak and all the deep blue gorges darkening down are filled with men and dogs and furious dust so in the time whereof thou weetest well the melancholy morning of the world he mopes or mumbles sleeps or shouts for glee and shakes his sides a cavern hutted king but when the oozel in the gaps at eve doth pipe her dreary ditty to the surge all tumbling in the soft green level light he sits as quiet as a thick mossed rock and dreameth in his cold old savage way of gliding barges on the wine-dark waves and glowing shapes and sweeter things than sleep but chiefly while the restless twofold bat goes flapping round the rainy eaves above where one broad opening letteth in the moon, he starteth, thinking of that grey-haired man, his sire. Then oftentimes the white-armed child of thunder-bearing Jove, young Thebe, comes and droops above him with her short sweet sighs for love distraught, for dear love's faded sake that weeps and sings and weeps itself to death because of casual eyes and lips of frost and careless mutterings and most weary years for think you doth the wan egyptian count this passion wasting like an unfed flame of any worth now seeing that his thighs are shrunk into a span and that the blood which used to spin tumultuous down his sides of life in leaping moments of desire 
is drying like a thin and sluggish stream in withered channels think you doth he pause for golden thebe and her red young mouth ah golden thebe thebe weeping there like some sweet wood nymph wailing for a rock if octus with the apollonian face that fair-haired prophet of the sun and stars could take a mist and dip it in the west to clothe thy limbs of shine about with shine and all the wonder of the amethyst he'd do it kneeling like a slave for thee if he could find a dream to comfort thee he'd bring it thinking little of his law but marvelling greatly at those eyes of thine yea if the shepherd waiting for thy steps pent down amongst the dank black weeded rims could shed his life like rain about thy feet he'd count it sweetness past all sweets of love to die by thee his life's end in thy sight oh but he loves the hunt doth ogyges and therefore should we blow the horn for him he sitting mumbling in his surf white cave with helpless feet and alienated eyes should hear the noises nathless dawn by dawn which send him wandering swiftly through the days when like a springing cataract he leapt from crag to crag the strongest in the chase to spear the lion leopard or the boar oh but he loves the hunt and while the shouts of mighty winds are in this mountained world behold the bleak white woodman winter halts and bends to him across a beard of snow for wonder seeing summer in his looks because of dogs and calls from throats of hair all in the savage hills of hyria and through the yellow evenings of the year what time september shows her mooned front and poppies burn to blackness droop for drouth the dear demeter splashed from heel to thigh with spinning vine blood often stoops to him to crush the grape against his wrinkled lips which sets him dreaming of the thickening wolves in darkness and the sound of moaning seas so with the blustering tempest doth he find a stormy fellowship for when the north comes reeling downward with a breath like spears where dryope the lonely sits all night and holds her sorrow crushed betwixt her palms he thinketh mostly of that time of times when zeus the thunderer broadly blazing king like some wild comet beautiful but fierce leapt out of cloud and fire and smote the tops of black ogygia with his red right hand at which great fragments tumbled to the deeps the mighty fragments of a mountain land and all the world became an awful sea but being tired the hairless ogyges best loveth night and dim forgetfulness for saith he to look for sleep is good when every sleep is as a sleep of death to men who live yet know not why they live nor how they live i have no thought to tell the people when this time of mine began but forest after forest grows and falls and rock by rock is wasted with the rhyme while i sit on and wait the end of all here taking every footstep for a sign an ancient shadow whiter than the foam end of poem this recording is in the public domain by the sea by henry kindle read for librivox dot org by larry wilson the caves of the sea have been troubled today with the water which whitens and widens and fills and a boat with our brother was driven away by a wind that came down from the tops of the hills behold i have seen on the threshold again a face in a dazzle of hair do you know that she watches the rain and the main and the waves which are moaning there ah moaning and moaning there now turn from your casements and fasten your doors and cover your faces and pray if you can there are wails in the wind and there are sighs on the shore and alas for the fate of the storm-beaten man o oh, dark falls the night on the rain-rutted verge so sad with the sound of the foam o oh, wild is the sweep of the swirl of the surge 
and his boat may never come home ah never and never come home end of poem this recording is in the public domain King Saulet Gilboa by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. King Saulet Gilboa With noise of battle and the dust of fray, half hidden fog the gloomy mountain lay, but Succoth's watchers from their outer fields saw fits of flame and gleams of clashing shields, for where the yellow river draws its spring, the hosts of israel travelled thundering there beating like the storm that sweeps to sea across the reefs of chafing galilee the car of abner and the sword of saul drave gaza down gilboa's southern wall but swift and sure the spears of ekron flew till peak and slope were drenched with bloody dew shout timnath shout the blazing leaders cried and hurled the stone and dashed the stave aside shout timnath shout let hazer hold the height bend the long bow and break the lords of fight from every hand the swarthy strangers sprang chief leaped on chief with buckler buckler rang the flower of armies set in syrian heat the ridges clamoured under labouring feet nor stayed the warriors till from salem's road the crescent horns of abner's squadrons glowed then like a shooting splendour on the wing the strong-armed son of kish came thundering and as in autumn's fall when woods are bare two adverse tempests meet in middle air so saul and akish grim with heat and hate met by the brook and shook the scales of fate for now the struggle swayed and firm as rocks against the storm wind of the equinox the rallied lords of judah stood and bore all day the fiery tides of fourfold war but he that fasted in the secret cave and called up samuel from the quiet grave and stood with darkness and the mantled ghosts a bitter night on shrill samarian coasts knew well the end of how the futile sword of israel would be broken by the lord how gath would triumph with the tawny line that bend the knee at dagon's brittle shrine and how the race of kish would fall to wreck because of vengeance stayed at amalek yet strove the sun-like king nor rested hand till yellow evening filled the level land then judah reeled before a biting hail of sudden arrows shot from acca's vale where libna lapped in blood from thigh to heel drew the tense string and pierced the quivering steel there fell the sons of saul and man by man the chiefs of israel up to jonathan and while swift akish stooped and caught the spoil ten chosen archers red with sanguine toil sped after saul who faint and sick and sore with many wounds had left the thick of war he like a baffled bull by hunters pressed turned sharp about and faced the flooded west and saw the star-like spears and moony spokes gleam from the rock and lighten through the oaks a sea of splendour how the chariots rolled on wheels of blinding brightness manifold while stumbling over spike and spine and spur of sultry lands escaped the son of ner with smitten men at this the front of saul grew darker than a blasted tower wall and seeing how there crouched upon his right aghast with fear a black amalekite he called and said i pray thee man of pain red from the scourge and recent from the chain set thou thy face to mine 
and stoutly stand with yonder bloody sword hilt in thy hand and fall upon me but the faltering hind stood trembling like a willow in the wind then further saul lest ashdod's vaunting hosts should bear me captive to their bleak-blown coasts i pray thee smite me seeing peace has fled and rest lies wholly with the quiet dead at this a flood of sunset broke and smote keen blazing sapphires round a kingly throat touched arm and shoulder glittered in the crest and made swift starlights on a jewelled breast so starting forward like a loosened hound the stranger clutched the sword and wheeled it round and struck the lord's anointed fierce and fleet philistia came with shouts and clattering feet by gaping gorges and by rough defile dark ashdod beat across a dusty mile hot hazers bowmen toiled from spire to spire and garth sprang upward like a gust of fire on either side did lipnar's lords appear and brass-clad timnath thundered in the rear mark akish mark south-west and south there sped a dabbled hireling from the dreadful dead mark akish mark the mighty front of saul great in his life and godlike in his fall this was the arm that broke philista's pride where kishon chaves his seaward going tide this was the sword that smote till set of sun red garth from michmash unto ajalon low in the dust and israel scattered far and dead the trumps and crushed the hoofs of war so fell the king as it was said by him who hid his forehead in a mantle dim at bleak ender what time unholy rites vexed the long sleep of still samarian heights for bowed to earth before the hoary priest did he of kish withstand the smoking feast to fast in darkness and in sackcloth rolled and house with wild things in the biting cold because of sharpness lent to gaza's sword and judah widowed by the angry lord so silence came and when the outer verge of carmel takes the white and whistling surge hoarse hollow noises fill the caves and roar along the margin of the echoing shore thus war had thundered but as evening breaks across the silver of assyrian lakes when reapers rest and through the level red of sunset peace like holy oil is shed thus silence fell but israel's daughters crept outside their thresholds waited watched and wept then they that dwell beyond the flats and fens of sudden jordan and in gelid glens of jabesh gilead chosen chiefs and few around their loins the hasty girdle drew and faced the forests huddled fold on fold and dells of glimmering greenness manifold what time orion in the west did set a shining foot on hills of wind and wet these journeyed nightly till they reached the capes where ashdod revelled over heated grapes and while the feast was loud and scouts were turned from saul's bound body court by court they burned and bore the king athwart the place of tombs and hasted eastward through the tufted glooms nor broke the cake nor stayed the step till morn shot over debir's cones and crags forlorn from jabesh when the weeping virgins came in jabesh then they built the funeral flame with costly woods they piled the lordly pyre brought yellow oils and fed the perfect fire while round the crescent stately elders spread the flashing armour of the mighty dead 
with crown and spear and all the trophies won from many wars by israel's dreadful son thence when the feet of evening paused and stood on shadowy mountains and the roaring flood as through a rushing twilight full of rain the weak moon looked athwart gadara's plain the younger warriors bore the urn and broke the humid turf about a wintering oak and buried saul and fasting went their ways and hid their faces seven nights and days end of poem this recording is in the public domain in the valley by henry kendall read for librivox.org by ann fletcher in the valley said the yellow-haired spirit of spring to the white-footed spirit of snow on the wings of the tempest take wing and leave me the valleys and go and straightway the streams were unchained and the frost-fettered torrents broke free and the strength of the winter wind waned in the dawn of a light on the sea then a morning breeze followed and fell and the woods were alive and astir with the pulse of a song in the dell and a whisper of day in the fir swift rings of sweet water were rolled down the ways where the lily leaves grew and the green and the white and the gold were wedded with purple and blue but the lips of the flower of the rose said where is the ending hereof is it sweet with you life at the close is it sad to be emptied of love and the voice of the flower of the peach was tender and touching in tone when each has been grafted on each it is sorrow to live on alone then the leaves of the flower of the vine said what will there be in the day when the reapers are red with my wine and the forests are yellow and grey and the tremulous flower of the quince made answer three seasons ago my sisters were star-like but since their graves have been made in the snow then the whispering flower of the fern said who will be sad at the death when summer blows over the burn with the fierceness of fire in her breath and the mouth of the flower of the sedge was opened to murmur and sigh sweet wind breaths that pause at the edge of the nightfall and falter and die end of poem this recording is in the public domain Twelve Sonnets by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug One, A Mountain Spring Peace hath an altar there, The sounding feet of thunder, And the wildering wings of rain, Against fire-rifted summits, Flash and beat, And through grey upper gorges Swoop and strain, But round that hallowed mountain spring Remain, year after year, the days of tender heat and gracious nights whose lips with flowers are sweet and filtered lights and lutes of soft refrain a still bright pool to men i may not tell the secret that its heart of water knows the story of a loved and lost repose yet this i say to cliff and close-leaved dell a fitful spirit haunts yon limpid well whose likeness is the faithless face of Rose. 2. Laura If Laura, lady of the flower-soft face, should light upon these verses, she may take the tenderest line, and through its pulses trace what man can suffer for a woman's sake. For in the nights that burn, the days that break, a thin pale figure stands in passion's place, and peace comes not, nor yet the perished grace of youth to keep old faiths and fires awake ah marvellous maid life sobs and sighing saith 
She left me, fleeting like a fluttered dove, but I would have a moment of her breath, so I might taste the sweetest sense thereof, and catch from blossoming honeyed lips of love some faint, some fair, some dim, delicious death. 3. By a River By red ripe mouth and brown luxurious eyes of her I love, by all your sweetness shed in far fair days, on one whose memory flies to faithless lights, and gracious speech gainsaid, I pray you, when yon river path I tread, make with the woodland some soft compromise, lest they should vex me into fruitless sighs with visions of a woman's gleaming head. For every green and golden-hearted thing that gathers beauty in that shining place, beloved of beams and wooed by wind and wing, is rife with glimpses of her marvellous face, and in the whispers of the lips of spring the music of her lute-like voice I trace. 4. Attila What though his feet were shod with sharp fierce flame, and death and ruin were his daily squires, the Scythian helped by heaven's thunders came, the time was ripe for God's avenging fires. Lo, loose lewd trulls, and lean luxurious liars had brought the fair fine face of Rome to shame, and made her one with sins beyond a name, that queenly daughter of imperial sires. The blood of elders, like the blood of sheep, was dashed across the circus, once while din and dust and lightnings, and a draggled heap of beast-slain men made lords with laughter leap, night fell with rain. The earth so sick of sin, had turned her face into the dark to weep. 5. A Reward Because a steadfast flame of clear intent gave force and beauty to full-actioned life, because his way was one of firm ascent, whose stepping stones were hewn of change and strife, because, as husband loveth noble wife, he loved fair truth, because the thing he meant to do, that thing he did, nor paused, nor bent in face of poor or pale conclusions. Yea, because of this, how fares the leader dead? What kind of mourners weep for him today? What golden shroud is at his funeral spread? Upon his brow what leaves of laurel say? About his breast is tied a sackcloth grey, and knots of thorns to face his lordly head. 6. To A handmaid to the genius of thy song is sweet, fair scholarship. Tis she supplies the fiery spirit of the passioned eyes with subtle syllables, whose notes belong to some chief source of perfect melodies. And glancing through a laurelled, lordly throng of shining singers, lo, my vision flies to William Shakespeare. He it is whose strong, full fruit-like music haunts thy stately verse. A worthy Levite of his court thou art, one sent among us to defeat the curse that binds us to the actual. Yea, thy part, O lute-voiced lover, is to lull the heart of love repelled, its darkness to disperse. 7. The Stanza of Child Harold Who framed the stanza of Child Harold? He it was who, halting on a stormy shore, knew well the lofty voice, which evermore, in grand distress, doth haunt the sleepless sea with solemn sounds. And, as each wave did roll, till one came up, the mightiest of the whole, to sweep and surge across the vacant lea, wild words were wedded to wild melody. This poet must have had a speechless sense of some dead summer's boundless affluence. Else, whither can we trace the passioned lore of beauty, steeping to the very core his royal verse, and that rare light which lies about it like a sunset in the skies. 8. A Living Poet He knows the sweet vexation in the strife of love with time, this bard who fain would stray to fairer place beyond the storms of life, with astral faces near him, 
day by day. In deep mossed dells, the mellow waters flow which best he loves, for there the echoes, rife with rich suggestions of his, long ago, Astarte pass with thee. And far away, dear southern seasons haunt the dreamy eye, spring, flowers owned, and summer, warbling low in tasselled corn, alternate, come and go, while gypsy autumn, splashed from heel to thigh with vine blood, treads the leaves, and, halting nigh, wild winter bends across a beard of snow. 9. Dante and Virgil When lost Francesca sobbed her broken tale of love and sin and boundless agony, while that one spirit by her side did wail and bite his lips for utter misery, the grief which could not speak, nor hear, nor see. So tender grew the superhuman face of one who listened, that a mighty trace of superhuman woe gave way, and pale, the sudden light upstruggled to its place, while all his limbs began to faint and fail with such excess of pity. But, behind, the Roman Virgil stood, the calm, the wise, with not a shadow in his regal eyes, a stately type of all his stately kind. 10. Rest Sometimes we feel so spent for want of rest, we have no thought beyond. I know today, when tired of bitter lips and dull delay with faithless words, I cast mine eyes upon the shadows of a distant mountain crest, and said, That hill must hide within its breast some secret glen secluded from the sun. O oh, Mother Nature, would that I could run outside to thee, and, like a wearied guest, half blind with lamps, and sick of feasting, lay an aching head on thee. Then down the streams the moon might swim, and I should feel her grace, while soft winds blew the sorrows from my face, so quiet in the fellowship of dreams. 11. After Parting I cannot tell what change hath come to you to vex your splendid hair. I only know one grief, the passion left betwixt us two, like some forsaken watchfire, burneth low. Tis sad to turn and find it dying so, without a hope of resurrection. Yet a radiant face that found me tired and lone, I shall not for the dear dead past forget the sweetest looks of all the summers gone. Ah, time hath made familiar wild regret. For now the leaves are white in last year's bowers, and now doth sob along the ruined leas the homeless storm from saddened southern seas, while March sits weeping over withered flowers. 12. Alfred Tennyson the silvery dimness of a happy dream I've known of late. Methought, where Byron moans, like some wild gulf in melancholy zones, I passed tear-blinded. Once a lurid gleam of stormy sunset loitered on the sea, while, travelling troubled like a straitened stream, the voice of Shelley died away from me. Still sore at heart, I reached a lake-lit lee, and then the green mossed glades, with many a grove, Where lies the calm which Wordsworth used to love. And lastly, Loxley Hall, from whence did rise a haunting song That blew and breathed and blew with rare delights. T'was there I woke, and knew the sumptuous comfort Left in drowsy eyes. End of section. This recording is in the public domain. Sutherland's Grave by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Carolyn. Sutherland's Grave Sutherland, Forby Sutherland, one of Captain Cook's seamen, who died shortly after the endeavour anchored in Botany Bay, 1770. He was the first Englishman buried in Australia. All night long the sea out yonder, all night long the wailful sea, 
vexed of winds and many thunders seeketh rest unceasingly seeketh rest in dens of tempest where like one distraught with pain shouts the wild-eyed sprite confusion seeketh rest and moans in vain ah but you should hear it calling calling when the haggard sky takes the darks and damps of winter with the mournful marsh fowl's cry even while the strong swift torrents from the rainy ridges come leaping down and breaking backwards million coloured shapes of foam then and then the sea out yonder chiefly looketh for the boon portioned to the pleasant valleys and the grave sweet summer moon boon of peace the still the saintly spirit of the dew dells deep yellow dells and hollows haunted by the soft dim dreams of sleep all night long the flying water breaks upon the stubborn rocks ooze filled forelands burnt and blackened smit and scarred with lightning shocks but above the tender sea thrift but beyond the flowering fern runs a little pathway westward pathway quaint with turn on turn westward trending thus it leads to shelving shores and slopes of mist sleeping shores and glassy bays of green and gold and amethyst there tread gently gently pilgrim there with thoughtful eyes look round cross thy breast and bless the silence lo the place is holy ground holy ground for ever stranger all the quiet silver lights dropping from the starry heavens through the soft australian nights dropping on those lone grave grasses come serene unbroken clear like the love of god the father falling falling year by year yea and like a voice supernal there the daily wind doth blow in the leaves above the sailor buried ninety years ago end of poem this recording is in the public domain Syrinx by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. Syrinx. A heap of low, dark, rocky coast, unknown to foot or feather, a sea voice moaning like a ghost, and fits of fiery weather. The flying syrinx turned and sped by dim, mysterious hollows, where night is black and day is red and frost the fire-wind follows strong heavy footfalls in the wake came up with flights of water the gods were mournful for the sake of laden's lovely daughter for when she came to spike and spine where reef and river gather her feet were sore with shell and chine she would not travel further across a naked strait of land blown sleet and surge were humming but trammelled with the shifting sand she heard the monster coming a thing of hoofs and horns and lust a gaunt goat-footed stranger she bowed her body in the dust and called on zeus to change her and called on hermes fair and fleet and her of hounds and quiver to hide her in the thickets sweet that sighed above the river so he that sits on flaming wheels and rules the sea and thunder caught up the setter by the heels and tore his skirts asunder while arcas of the glittering plumes took laden's daughter lightly and set her in the gracious glooms that mix with moon mist nightly and touched her lips with wild flower wine and changed her body slowly till in soft reeds of song and shine her life was hidden wholly end of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. On the Peru by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. On the Peru. Peru, the name of a watercourse often dry, which in flood time reaches the river Darling. As when the strong stream of a wintering sea rolls round our coast with boatful breaks of storm, and swift salt rain, and bitter wind that saith wild things and woeful of the white south land, alone with God and silence in the cold, as when this cometh, men from dripping doors look forth and shudder for the mariners abroad so we for absent brothers looked in days of a drought and when the flying floods swept boundless roaring down the bold black plains beyond the farthest spur of western hills for where the barwon cuts a rotten land or lies unshaken like a great blind creek between hot mouldering banks it came to this all in a time of short and thirsty sighs that thirty rainless months had left the pools and grass as dry as ashes then it was our kinsmen started for the lone peru from point to point with patient strivings sheer across the horrors of the windless downs blue gleaming like a sea of molten steel but never drought had broke them never flood had quenched them they with mighty youth and health and those and sinews knotted like the trees they like the children of the native woods could stem the strenuous waters or outlive the crimson days and dull dead nights of thirst like camels yet of what avail was strength alone to them though it was like the rocks on stormy mountains in the bloody time when fierce sleep caught them in the camps at rest and violent darkness gripped the life in them and whelmed them as an eagle unawares is whelmed and slaughtered in a sudden snare all murdered by the blacks smit while they lay in silver dreams and with the far faint fall of many waters breaking in their sleep yea in the tracts unknown of any man save savages the dim discovered ways of footless silence or unhappy winds the wild men came upon them like a fire of desert thunder and the fine firm lips that touched a mother's lips a year before and hands that knew a dearer hand than life were hoon a sacrifice before the stars and left with hooting owls and blowing clouds and falling leaves and solitary wings ay you may see their graves you who have toiled and tripped and thirsted like these men of ours for verily i say that not so deep their bones are that the scattered drift and dust of gusty days will never leave them bare o oh, dear dead bleaching bones i know of those who have the wild strong will to go and sit outside all things with you and keep the ways aloof from bats and snakes and trampling feet that smite your peace and theirs who have the heart without the lusty limbs to face the fire and moonless midnights and to be indeed for very sorrow like a moaning wind in wintry forests with perpetual rain because of this because of sisters left with desperate purpose and dishevelled hair and broken breath and sweetness quenched in tears because of swifter silver from the head and furrows for the face because of these that should have come with age that come with pain o master father sitting where our eyes are tired of looking 
say for once are we are we to set our lips with weary smiles before the bitterness of life and death and call it honey while we bear away a taste like wormwood turn thyself and sing sing son of sorrow is there any gain for breaking of the loins for melting the eyes and knees as weak as water any peace or hope for casual breath and labouring lips for clapping of the palms and sharper sighs than frost or any light to come for those who stand and mumble in the alien streets with heads as grey as winter any balm for pleading women and the love that knows of nothing left to love they sleep a sleep unknown of dreams these darling friends of ours and we who taste the core of many tales of tribulation we whose lives are salt with tears indeed we therefore hide our eyes and weep in secret lest our grief should risk the rest that hath no hurt from daily racks of fiery clouds and immemorial rains end of poem this recording is in the public domain Faith in God by Henry Kindle, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Have faith in God, for whosoever lists to calm conviction in these days of strife will learn that in this steadfast stand exists the scholarship severe of human life. This face to face with doubt, I know how strong his thews must be who fights and falls and bears by sleepless nights and vigils lone and long and many a woeful wraith of wrestling prayers yet trust him not in an old man throned with thunders on an everlasting cloud but in that awful entity and zoned by no wild wraths nor bitter homage loud when from the summit of some sudden steep of speculation you have strength to turn to things too boundless for the broken sweep of finer comprehension wait and learn that god hath been his own interpreter from first to last so you will understand the tribe who best succeed when men most err to suck through fogs the fatness of the land one thing is surer than the autumn tents we saw last week in yonder river bent that all our poor expression helps and hints however vaguely to the solemn end that god is truth and if our dim ideal falls short of fact so short that we must weep why shape specific sorrows though the real but not the song which erewhile made us sleep remember truth draws upward this to us of steady happiness should be a cause beyond the differential calculus of kant's dull dogmas and mechanic laws a man is manliest when he wisely knows how vain it is to halt and pule and pine whilst under every mystery haply flows the finest issue of a love divine end of poem this recording is in the public domain Mountain Moss by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Cal Taylor. It lies amongst the sleeping stones, far down the hidden mountain glade, and past its brink the torrent moans forever in a dreamy shade. A little patch of dark green moss, whose softness grew of quiet ways, with all its deep delicious floss, in slumber's suns of summer days. You know the place? with pleasant tints the broken sunset lights the bowers and then the woods are full with hints of distant dear voluptuous flowers tis often now the pilgrim turns a faded face towards that seat and cools his brow amongst the ferns the runnel dabbling at his feet there fierce december seldom goes with scorching step and dust and drought but soft and low october blows sweet odors from her dewy mouth and autumn like a gypsy bold doth gather near it grapes and grain ere winter comes the woodman old to lop the leaves in wind and rain 
O oh, greenest moss of mountain glen, the face of rose is known to thee, but we shall never share with men a knowledge dear to love and me. For are they not between us save the words my darling used to say, what time the western waters laved the forehead of the fainting day? Cool comfort we had on your breast, while yet the fervid noon burned mute, o'er barley field and barren crest, and leagues of gardens flushed with fruit. O oh, sweet and low, we whispered so, and sucked the pulp of plum and peach, but it was many years ago, when each, you know, was loved of each. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Glen of Arrawatta by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. The Glen of Arrawatta. A sky of wind, and while these fitful gusts are beating round the windows in the cold, with sullen sobs of rain, behold I shape a settler's story of the wild old times, one told by campfires when the station drays were housed and hidden forty years ago while swarthy drivers smoked their pipes and drew and crowded round the friendly gleaming flame that lured the dingo howling from his caves and brought sharp sudden feet about the brakes a tale of love and death and shall i say a tale of love in death for all the patient eyes that gathered darkness watching for a son and brother never dreaming of the fate the fearful fate he met alone unknown within the ruthless australasian wastes for in a far-off sultry summer rimmed with thunder-clouds and red with forest fires all day by ways uncouth and ledges rude the wild men held upon a stranger's trail which ran against the rivers and athwart the gorges of the deep blue western hills and when a cloudy sunset like the flame in windy evenings on the plains of thirst beyond the dead banks of the fair baku lay heavy down the topmost peaks they came with pent-in breath and stealthy steps and crouched like snakes among the grasses till the night had covered face from face and thrown the gloom of many shadows on the front of things there in the shelter of a nameless glen fenced round by cedars and the tangled growths of blackwood stained with brown and shot with grey the jaded white man built his fire and turned his horse adrift among the water-pools that trickled underneath the yellow leaves and made a pleasant murmur like the brooks of england through the sweet autumnal noons then after he had slacked his thirst and used the forest fare for which a healthful day of mountain life had brought a zest he took his axe and shaped with boughs and wattle forks a whirly fashioned like a bushman's roof the door brought out athwart the strenuous flame the black thatched in against a rising wind and while the sturdy hatchet filled the cliffs with sounds unknown the immemorial hounds of echoes sent their lonely dwellers forth who lived a life of wonder flying round and round the glen what time the kangaroo leapt from his lair and huddled with the bats far scattering down the wildly startled fells then came the doleful owl and evermore the bleak morass gave out the bittern's call the plover's cry and many a fitful wail of chilly omen falling on the ear like those cold flaws of wind that come and go an hour before the break of day anon the stranger held from toil and settling down he drew rough solace from his well-filled pipe and smoked into the night revolving there the primal questions of a squatter's life for in the flats a short day's journey past 
his present camp his station yards were kept with many a lodge and paddock jutting forth across the heart of unnamed prairie lands now loud with bleating and the cattle bells and misty with the hot fire's daily smoke wide spreading flats and western spurs of hills that dipped to plains of dim perpetual blue bold summits set against the thunder heaps and slopes be hacked and crushed by battling kine where now the furious tumult of their feet gives back the dust and up from glen and brake evokes fierce clamour and becomes indeed a token of the squatter's daring life which growing inland growing year by year doth set us thinking in these latter days and makes one ponder of the lonely lands beyond the lonely tracks of burke and wills where when the wandering steward fixed his camps in central wastes afar from any home or haunt of man and in the changeless midst of sullen deserts and the footless miles of sultry silence all the ways about grew strangely vocal and a marvellous noise became the wonder of the waxing glooms now after darkness like a mighty spell amongst the hills and dim dispeopled dells had brought a stillness to the soul of things it came to pass that from the secret depths of dripping gorges many a runnel voice came mellowed with the silence and remained about the caves a sweet though alien sound now rising ever like a fervent flute in moony evenings when the theme is love now falling as ye hear the sunday bells while hastening fieldward from the gleaming town then fell a softer mood and memory paused with faithful love amidst the sainted shrines of youth and passion in the valleys past of dear delights which never grow again and if the stranger who had left behind far anxious homesteads in a wave-swept isle to face a fierce sea-circle day by day and hear at night the dark atlantic's moan now took a hope and planned a swift return with wealth and health and with a youth unspent to those sweet ones that stayed with want at home say who shall blame him though the years are long and life is hard and waiting makes the heart grow old thus passed the time until the moon serene stood over high dominion like a dream of peace within the white transfigured woods and o'er the vast dew-dripping wilderness of slopes illumined with her silent fires then far beyond the home of pale red leaves and silver sluices and the shining stems of runnel blooms the dreamy wanderer saw the wilder for the vision of the moon stark desolations and a waste of plain all smit by flame and broken with the storms black ghosts of trees and sapless trunks that stood harsh hollow channels of the fiery noise which ran from bowl to bowl a year before and grew with ruin and was like indeed the roar of mighty winds with wintering streams that foam about the limits of the land and mix their swiftness with the flying seas now when the man had turned his face about to take his rest behold the gem-like eyes of ambushed wild things stared from bowl and brake with dumb amaze and faint recurring glance and fear anon that drove them down the brush while from the den the dingo like a scout in sheltered ways crept out and cowered near to sniff the tokens of the stranger's feast and marvel at the shadows of the flame thereafter grew the wind and chafing depths in distant waters sent a troubled cry across the slumberous forest 
and the chill of coming rain was on the sleeper's brow when flat as reptiles hutted in the scrub a deadly crescent crawled to where he lay a band of fierce fantastic savages that starting naked round the faded fire with sudden spears and swift terrific yells came bounding wildly at the white man's head and faced him staring like a dream of hell here let me pass i would not stay to tell of hopeless struggles under crushing blows of how the surging fiends with thickening strokes howled round the stranger till they drained his strength how love and life stood face to face with hate and death and then how death was left alone with night and silence in the sobbing rains so after many moons the searchers found the body mouldering in the mouldering dell amid the fungi and the bleaching leaves and buried it and raised a stony mound which took the mosses then the place became the haunt of fearful legends and the lair of bats and adders there he lies and sleeps from year to year in soft australian nights and through the furnaced noons and in the times of wind and wet yet never mourner comes to drop upon that grave the christian's tear or pluck the foul dank weeds of death away but while the english autumn filled her lap with faded gold and while the reapers cooled their flame-red faces in the clover grass they looked for him at home and when the frost had made a silence in the morning lanes and cooped the farmers by december fires they looked for him at home and through the days which brought about the million-coloured spring with moon-like splendours in the garden plots they looked for him at home while summer danced a shining singer through the tasselled corn they looked for him at home from sun to sun they waited season after season went and memory wept upon the lonely moors and hope grew voiceless and the watchers passed like shadows one by one away and he whose fate was hidden under forest leaves and in the darkness of untrodden dells became a marvel often by the hearths in winter nights and when the wind was wild outside the casements children heard the tale of how he left their native vales behind where he had been a child himself to shape new fortunes for his father's fallen house of how he struggled how his name became by fine devotion and unselfish zeal a name of beauty in a selfish land and then of how the aching hours went by with patient listeners praying for the step which never crossed the floor again so passed the tale to children but the bitter end remained a wonder like the unknown grave alone with god and silence in the hills end of poem this recording is in the public domain Euterpe by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Murray Child of light, the bright, the bird-like, Wilt thou float and float to me? Facing winds and sleets and waters, Flying glimpses of the sea? Down amongst the hills of tempest, Where the elves of tumult roam, Blown wet shadows of the summits, Dim, sonorous sprites of foam. Here and here my days are wasted, Shorn of leaf and stripped of fruit, Vexed because of speech half-spoken, Maiden with the marvelous lute. Vexed because of songs half-shapen, Smit with fire and mixed with pain, part of thee and part of sorrow like a sunset pale with rain child of light the bright the bird-like 
Wilt thou float and float to me? Facing winds and sleets and waters, Flying glimpses of the sea. All night long, in fluent pauses, Falling far, but full, but fine, Faultless friend of flowers and fountains, Do I hear that voice of thine? All night long, amidst the burden Of the lordly storm that sings, High above the tumbled forelands, Fleet and fierce with thunderings. Then and then, my love, Euterpe, Lips of life replete with dreams, Murmur for thy sweet, sharp fragments Dying down Lathian streams. Murmur for thy mouth's marred music, Splendid hints that burn and break, Heavy with excess of beauty. Murmur for thy music's sake. All night long in fluent pauses, Falling far, but full, but fine, Faultless friend of flowers and fountains, Do I hear that voice of thine? In the yellow flame of evening, Sound of thee doth come and go Through the noises of the river And the drifting of the snow. In the yellow flame of evening, At the setting of the day, Sound that lightens, falls and lightens, flickers, faints, and fades away. I am famished of thy silence, broken for that tender note, caught with its surpassing passion, caught and strangled in thy throat. We have naught to help thy trouble, not for that which lieth mute on the harp string and the lute string and the spirit of the lute. In the yellow flame of evening, sound of thee doth come and go through the noises of the river and the drifting of the snow. Daughter of the dead red summers, men that laugh and men that weep call thee music. Shall I follow, choose their name and turn and sleep? What thou art, behold, I know not, but thy honey slakes and slays half the want which whitens manhood in the stress of alien days. Even as a wondrous woman, struck with love and great desire, hast thou been to me, Euterpe, half of tears and half of fire, but thy joy is swift and fitful, and a subtle sense of pain sighs through thy melodious breathing, takes the rapture from thy strain. Daughter of the dead red summers, men that laugh and men that weep call thee music. Shall I follow, choose their name, and turn and sleep? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ellen Ray by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Murray A quiet song for Ellen, the patient Ellen Ray, a dreamer in the nightfall, a watcher in the day, the wedded of the sailor who keeps so far away a shadow on his forehead for patient Ellen Ray. When autumn winds were driving across the chafing bay, he said the words of anger that wasted Ellen Ray. He said the words of anger and went his bitter way. Her dower was the darkness, the patient Ellen Ray. Your comfort is a phantom, my patient Ellen Ray. You house it in the night time, it fronts you in the day. And when the moon is very low, and when the lights are gray, 
You sit and hug a sorry hope, my patient Ellen Ray. You sit and hug a sorry hope, yet who will dare to say the sweetness of October is not for Ellen Ray? The bearer of a burden must rest at fall of day, and you have borne a heavy one, my patient Ellen Ray. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Dusk by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Cal Taylor. At dusk, like flowers that shun the day, shy thoughts from dim recess break, and plead for words I dare not say, for your sweet sake. My early love, my first, my last, Mistakes have been that both must rue, but all passion of the past survives for you. The tender message hope might send sinks fainting at the lips of speech, for are you lover, are you friend, that I would reach? How much tonight I'd give to win, a banished peace, an old repose, but here I sit and sigh and sin when no one knows. The stern, the steadfast reticence, which made the dearest phrases halt, and checked the first and finest sense was not my fault. I held my words because there grew about my life persistent pride, and you were loved who never knew what love could hide. This purpose filled my soul like flame to win you wealth and take the place where care is not nor any shame to vex your face. I said, till then my heart must keep its secrets safe and unconfessed, and days and nights unknown to sleep the vow attest. Yet, oh, my sweet, it seems so long since you were near, and fate's retard, the sequel of a struggle strong, and life is hard, too hard when one is left alone, to wrestle passion never free, to turn and say to you, my own, come home to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Safi by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. Safi Strong pinions bore Safi, the dreamer, through the dazzle and whirl of a race, and the earth, raying up in confusion, like a sea thundered under his face, and the earth, raying up in confusion, passed flying and flying afar, till it dropped like a moon into silence and waned from a moon to a star was it light was it shadow he followed that he swept through those desperate tracts with his hair beating back on his shoulders like the tops of the wind hackled flax i come murmured safi the dreamer i come but thou fliest before but thy way hath the breath of the honey and the scent of the myrrh evermore his eyes were the eyes of a watcher held on by luxurious faith and his lips were the lips of a longer amazed with the beauty of death for ever and ever he murmured my love for the sweetness with thee do i follow thy footsteps said safi like the wind on a measureless sea and fronting the furthermost spaces he kept through the distances dim till the days and the years and the cycles were lost and forgotten by him when he came to the silver star portals the queen of that wonderful place looked forth from her towers resplendent and started and dreamt in his face and one said this is safi the only who lived in a planet below and housed him apart from his fellows a million of ages ago he erred if he suffers to clutch at high lights from the wood and the street not caring to see how his brothers were content with the things at their feet but she whispered ah turn to the stranger he looks like a lord of the land for his eyes are the eyes of an angel and the thought on his forehead is grand is there never a peace for the sinner whose sin is in this that he mars the light of his worship of beauty forgetting the flower for the stars 
behold him my sister immortal and doubt that he knoweth his shame who raves in the shadow for sweetness and gloats on the ghost of a flame his sin is his sin if he suffers who wilfully straitened the truth and his doom is his doom if he follows a lie without sorrow or ruth and another from uttermost verges ran out with a terrible voice let him go it is well that he goeth though he break with the lot of his choice i come murmured safi the dreamer i come but thou fliest before but thy way hath the breath of the honey and the scent of the myrrh evermore my queen said the first of the voices he hunteth a perilous wraith arrayed with voluptuous fancies and ringed with tyrannical faith wound up in the heart of his error he must sweep through the silences dire like one in the dark of a desert allured by a fallacious fire and she faltered and asked like a doubter when he hangs on those spaces sublime with the terror that knoweth no limit and holdeth no record of time forgotten of god and the demons will he keep to his fancy amain can he live for that horrible chaos of flame and perpetual rain but an answer as soft as a prayer fell down from a high hidden land and the words were the words of a language which none but the gods understand end of poem this recording is in the public domain daniel henry denai by henry kendall read for librivox dot org by carolyn daniel henry denai take the harp but very softly for our brothers touch the strings wind and wood shall help to wail him waves and mournful mountain springs take the harp but very softly for the friend who grew so old through the hours we would not hear of nights we would not fain behold other voices sweeter voices shall lament him year by year though the morning finds us lonely though we sit and marvel here marvel much while summer cometh trammelled with november wheat gold about her forehead gleaming green and gold about her feet yea and while the land is dark with plover gull and gloomy gleed where the cold swift songs of winter fill the interlucent reed yet my harp and o oh, my fathers never look for sorrow's lay making life a mighty darkness in the patient noon of day since he resteth whom we loved so out beyond these fleeting seas blowing clouds and restless regions paved with old perplexities in a land where thunder breaks not in a place unknown of snow where the rain is mute for ever where the wild winds never go home of far-forgotten phantoms genie of our peaceful prime shining by perpetual waters past the ways of change and time heaven of the harried spirit where it folds its wearied wings turns its face and sleeps asleep with deep forgetfulness of things his should be a grave by mountains in a cool and thick mossed lee with the lone creek falling past it falling ever to the sea his should be a grave by waters by a bright and broad lagoon making steadfast splendours hallowed by the quiet shining moon there the elves of many forests wandering winds and flying lights born of green of happy mornings dear to yellow summer nights full of dole for him that loved them then might halt and then might go finding fathers of the people to their children speaking low speaking low of one who failing suffered all the poet's pain dying with the dead leaves round him hopes which never grow again end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Merope by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Murray. Far in the ways of the hyaline wastes, in the face of the splendid six of the sisters, the star-dowered sisters, ineffably bright, Merope sitteth, the shadow-like wife of a monarch unfriended of Aedes, of Orcus, the fierce, the implacable god of the night. Merope, fugitive Merope, lost to thyself and thy lover, cast like a dream out of thought, with the moons which have passed into sleep, what shall avail thee, Alcyone's tears, or the sight to discover of Sisyphus pallid for thee by the blue, bitter lights of the deep? Pallid but patient for sorrow? O oh, thou of the fire and the water, half with the flame of the sunset, and kin to the streams of the sea, hast thou the songs of old times for desire of thy dark-featured daughter, sweet with the lips of thy yearning, O oh, Ethra, with tokens of thee, songs that would lull her, like kisses forgotten of silence, where speech was less than the silence that bound it, as passion is bound by a ban. Seeing we know of thee, mother, we turning and hearing how each was wrapped in the other, ere Merope faltered and fell for a man. Mortal she clave to, forgetting her birthright, forgetting the lord-like sons of the many-winged father, and chiefs of the plume and the star. Therefore, because that her sin was the grief of the grand and the godlike, sitteth thy child then a morning moon bleaker, the faded and far, ringed with the flower-like six of the seven, arrayed and anointed, ever with beautiful pity, she watches, she weeps, and she wanes, blind as a flame on the hills of the winter in hours appointed for the life of the foam and the thunder, the strength of the imminent rains. Who hath a portion, Alcyone, like her? Asterope, fairer, then sunset on snow, and beloved of all brightness, say what is there left sadder and paler than Pleone's daughter, disconsolate bearer of trouble that smites like a sword of the gods to the break of the heft? Demeter and Dryope, known to the forests, the falls, and the fountains, yearly, because of their walking and wailing and wringing of hands, are they as one with this woman? Of Hyri, wild in the mountains, breaking her heart in the frosts and the fires of the uttermost lands, these have their bitterness. This for Persephone, that for Acalian homes, and the lights of a kindness blown out with the stress of her shame one for her child and one for her sin, but thou above all art an alien. Girt with the halos that vex thee and wrapped in a grief beyond name. Yet saith Sisyphus, Sisyphus, stricken and chained of the minioned kings of great darkness and trodden in dust by the feet of the fates, Sweet are the ways of thy watching, and pallid and perished and pinioned, moon amongst maidens. I leap for thy love like a god at the gates, leap for the dreams of a rose of the heavens, and beat at the portals, paved with the pain of unsatisfied pleadings for thee and for thine. But Zeus is immutable master, and these are the walls the immortals build for our sighing, and who may set lips 
at the Lord's and repine. Therefore, he saith, I am sick for thee, Merope, faint for the tender touch of thy mouth, and the eyes like the lights of an altar to me. But lo, thou art far, and thy face is a still and a sorrowful splendor, and the storm is abroad with the rain on the perilous straits of the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After the Hunt by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Cal Taylor Underneath the windy mountain walls Forth we rode an eager band By the surges and the verges and the gorges Till the night was on the land On the hazy, mazy land Far away the bounding prey Leapt across the ruts and logs But we galloped, galloped, galloped on Till we heard the yapping of the dogs the yapping and the yelping of the dogs. Oh, it was a madly merry day, we shall not so soon forget, and the edges and the ledges and the ridges haunt us with their echoes yet. Echoes, echoes, echoes yet. While the moon is on the hill, gleaming through the streaming fogs, don't you hear the yapping of the dogs, the yapping and the yelping of the dogs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rose Lorraine by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Cal Taylor Sweet water moons blown into lights Of flying gold on pool and creek And many sounds and many sights Of younger days are back this week. I cannot say I sought to face Or greatly cared to cross again the subtle spirit of the place whose life is mixed with Rose Lorraine. What though her voice rings clearly through a nightly dream I gladly keep, no wish have I to start anew, heart fountains that have ceased to leap, here face to face with different days and later things that plead for love. It would be worse than wrong to raise a phantom far too fain to move. But Rose Lorraine, ah, Rose Lorraine, I'll whisper now where no one hears, if you should chance to meet again the man you kissed in soft dead years, just say for once he suffered much, and add to this his fate was worse because of me, my voice, my touch. There is no passion like the first. If I that breathe your slow, sweet name, as one breathes low notes on a flute, have vexed your peace with word of blame, the phrase is dead, the lips are mute, yet when I turn towards the wall, in stormy nights and times of rain, I often wish you could recall your tender speeches, Rose Lorraine, because, you see, I thought them true, and did not count you self-deceived, and gave myself in all to you, and looked on love as life achieved, then came the bitter sudden change, the fastened lips, the dumb despair, the first few weeks were very strange, and long, and sad, and hard to bear. No woman lives with power to burst, my passions bond and set me free. For Rose is last where Rose was first, and only Rose is fair to me. The faintest memory of her face, the willful face that hurt me so, is followed by a fiery trace that Rose Lorraine must never know. I keep a faded ribbon string you used to wear about your throat, and of this pale, this perished thing, I think I know the threads by rote. God help such love to touch your hand to loiter where your feet might fall. You marvelous girl, my soul would stand the worst of hell, its fires and all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of Leaves from Australian Forest by Henry Kendall.